Welcome to episode 277 of Sports Geek. On this week's CEO series episode, I chat with Netball New Zealand's CEO, Jenny Wiley. Welcome to Sports Geek, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host, who is back riding a bike for the first time in 25 years, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. Yes, my name is Sean Callanan, and I am back on the bike. Uh, probably for this for the first time in 25 years. It's been sitting there for a while with the promise of doing it, but uh, the little ex- uh, excursions uh, to get a bit of exercise, I have been trying uh, to get on the bike. Um, my name is Sean Callanan. You, you can find me on all places social at Sean Callanan, S-E-A-N-C-A-L-L-A-N-A-N, or Sports Geek, or you can contact me the old-fashioned way, uh, Sean at SportsGeekHQ.com. Uh, you can find this podcast on all good podcasting platforms. I'm really interested to know where you are listening. You might be doing so on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or my favorite podcast platform. I haven't done it for a while. Shout out to pocket casts uh, for those of you who know who i've that i have an affinity to pocket casts welcome back um don't forget uh you can also join us on our sports biz zoom calls that i'm hosting twice weekly uh covering different topics that we're all facing facing right now uh you can register by going to sportsgeekhq.com slash zoom calls to register your details you can also go to the website it's you should find the links if you can't find the links i'm not doing my job right Last week, um, or this week as I'm recording it, last week uh, we spoke about sponsorship and a really good discussion about how it's going to change uh, the conversations people are having with their partners, um, how the sponsorship product will change, how we're going to cater for things like hospitality um, in a social distance world. Uh, So a really good discussion uh, this week uh, coming up um, as of recording um, will be about stadiums and menus. Um, So you can either tune in on Tuesdays at 8 p.m. or Wednesdays at 10 a.m. That's Australian Eastern Standard Time. Um, But the idea is there is a time there for people in uh, Europe and and South Africa and the like. Um, And there is a time for people in Australia during their business hours and also uh, some of our friends in the US. Uh, So please join us. Um, Hopefully it's worthwhile for your evening. Um, Yeah, this week at stadiums and venues is going to be the conversation Uh, Next week, we're going to be talking about mobile. How will the mobile experience and the way we do apps and how we engage with fans on mobile, how is that going to change? Um, um, How it's going to change during COVID and post? Um, And then because it has been a bit of a recurring theme, um, May 26, 27, we're going to look at grassroots uh, and participation and what's going to need, what's going to be needed to be done in that space. Um, thank you very much to everyone who's attended. Uh, shout out especially to podcast guests that are turning up on the call. I uh, really appreciate it. Todd Kaflish, Cash Helbron, Pete Minio, Daniel Brzezinski. Uh Sorry, Brew, I try my best to do your name correctly and I mangle names all the time. Uh, Pete Holterman, Jess Ivers, Steve Pastorino, Lenny Go, Pete Locke. They're some of the podcast guests that have come on and you know really do appreciate them joining in the conversation um and what i also do appreciate is is the people who are supporting the patreon uh campaign for all the content that we're putting up around the sports business space both the podcasts uh the newsletters um and now the zoom calls so thank you very much cass uh for becoming a patron really do appreciate it it does help pay for the costs of uh, the podcast and the hosting and everything that's required to keep uh, this content machine moving on. And it does help at this time when the work is a little bit less than it has been in the past. So if you want to be a, a patron of Sports Geek, you can do so by going to sportsgeekhq.com slash Patreon. Um, you can do so for as little as $4 a month. And if you are a business, um, whether you are a startup in the space of sports or you're a uh, you're a sports technology firm. Uh, you can support in that way and reach the audience and have your logo and links in every single show notes. Uh, please check them out and uh, find out what they're doing because they are supporting what I'm doing here. Uh, today's guest um, is Jenny Wiley. She is the CEO of Netball New Zealand. Netball is a, an amazing uh, sport. Uh, and it's a sport probably needs some explanation for some of my US friends and some of the friends in Europe. Um, 
uh, it is a it is a sport that's a largely a female participation sport and one of the biggest female participation sport here in Australia and in New Zealand. Um, seven aside, uh, fast game. I've actually played it before in a mixed form. Uh, um, yeah, a lot of fun to play, really quick moving. Um, so I talked to Jenny and thank you very much to Shane Harmon uh, for uh, connecting us and showing and talking so highly of Jenny. Uh, so I caught up with Jenny to talk about uh, what Netball has done, how they've rebuilt Netball um, in coming out of um, and setting their strategy out of some uh, out of some uh, uh, some disappointing results at the top level and also how it sort of steeled them for what they need to do coming out of this crisis. So this is my chat uh, with Jenny Wiley, uh, the CEO of Netball New Zealand. Very happy to be joined by Jenny Wiley, the CEO of Netball New Zealand. Welcome to the podcast, Jenny. Thank you, Sean. Well, um, it's good to catch up. Um, we are all in lockdown um, at the at the minute, but I, I wanted to dive in on the CEO series that we've been been doing and sort of find out how you got your found your way into the world of sport. How did you uh, um, find your way into the world of sport? Well, I think growing up as a kid in New Zealand, sport was massive um, for me. I couldn't wait to get out there on the netball court. That was my thing, um, yep. and really lucky to have mum as a coach. Um, back a long time ago now, um, and for for me it was it was just uh, everything I wanted to do. I couldn't sleep on a Friday night because I actually just couldn't wait for netball to be on the next yep. morning. Um, so yeah, massively fanatical about it, about it. Um, Mum played tennis for New Zealand, um, but I could never take up a a sport that didn't involve other people. It was always going to have others around me. So yep. yeah, um, netball was my thing from an early age. And so from a career point of view, you came at it from a, from a finance background. Is that how your initial training was and your initial uh, uh, jobs in the finance and accounting sort of sector? Yeah. Well, when I worked out, I was never going to play for New Zealand because I yep. didn't have the skills or the talent. I, yeah. um, and I kind of worked out I was quite good with the numbers. So yep. what I actually did is went and traveled like um, most Kiwis and Aussies, did my OE, but I got my professional qualifications before I left. And so I had the opportunity to see the world, um, you know, bounce around a few different organisations and came home and um, really wanted to be involved in sport, but there were fewer opportunities out there. Um, but what I did do is I tapped on the door of Netball New Zealand several times and said, when you're ready for me, let me know. Yep. Um, and about 10 years ago, someone opened the door and um, I ran through it. So, yeah, I've been uh, been there ever since. Um, started in finance because that is my background. Yep. Um, but I think with any sport, you've got to be multifaceted. You get involved in any, everything and anything. Um, and that was a really good grounding for me uh, starting out in that space. I mean, sport remains a really hard uh, nut to crack to, to get in. So getting that breadth of skills across uh, different consulting firms, but then also in the telco space in some of your work, but then yeah. diving in on the on the finance strategy piece, what did what did Netball New Zealand look like when you first came in in 2009 and you, you know, you're the accountant and you looking at the numbers? What did it look like then? Well, I think coming into sport, it was a massive eye-opener for me. It was a good reset opportunity to learn um, and be involved in something I was passionate about. But at the time, we were less than a $10 million business. Yep. Um, we had, I think, 12 zones, uh, sorry, 12 regions, five franchise teams. There was lots of governance going on. There was um, a reliance on gaming funding, which is a, a quirk of the New Zealand system. And um, a, a massively strong volunteer base, and that yep. hasn't changed. Yep. Um, but the landscape was quite different. You know, um, things were, you know, the Silver Ferns were on TV. There was the new Trans-Tasman Championship just sort of standing up. Um, so if we reflect on those times, there was some growth in that women's sport and getting on broadcast and what yep. have you. And the Aussie teams were also starting to see that start to happen. Um, but we were still in our infancy around really looking at that future planning around how we're going to remain sustainable in the future and that evolving landscape of sports. So, um, yeah, it was quite a different different period of time for us. 
And so you've been in the CEO, CEO role. You come out from four years in, in July. Yeah. Uh, what what has been some of the, I guess, the pillars and the things you've been trying to drive at Netbuild New Zealand to sort of take it from that early those early days of the fragmentation and the strong volunteer base, the strong passion at the really grassroots and, you know, because that's one of the challenges of a lot of sports is harnessing that big uh, volunteer and participation base up to the very up to the very top. Yeah, well, I think um, that's still there, but yeah. I think the landscape's changing. So parents are now having to be at work. So the volunteering mindset, whilst it's still there, it becomes um, incredibly, you know, needing to be balanced with every other requirement on people's time. Um, but we have more than doubled our revenue in that 10 years that I've been here. Um, we've gone through a massive restructure. We went from those 17 different entities to five. Yep. Um, and really tried to hone out in on what was important to us and what is our point of difference in terms of the sporting landscape in New Zealand. Um, in the four years that I've been in this role, I guess my first year was very much, you know, the Silver Ferns were performing as we'd expect. Yep. And then they had the worst Commonwealth Games campaign known in the history of netball. Uh, we, we lost to Malawi, which was an incredible shock. Um, and from there, that was my first moment of being able to actually start to stamp my brand on the leadership of this organisation because um, rather than having a plan that was formed under a different leadership group and a coach employed under a different leadership group, this became my opportunity to start reshaping. Um, and you never want to waste a good crisis. So I guess, yep. you know, we, we got quite battle hardened because we had to. We had to change. We had to move. We had to try some stuff that hadn't been done in the world of netball before. And we, we had to be brave enough to do it in a public forum where we were owning our mistakes. Yeah. Um, and we lived all this out in the, in the public eye and the media scrutiny on us was quite intense. Um, and particularly on the decision making that I was going to implement as a result of it. So we went to a really low place, um, but I think from my mind, what that demonstrated to me is the power of what netball is in this country here in New Zealand. It was like a group of women wrapped their arms around the sport and said, this is not going to be our new normal. Yep. We, will, we will fix this. And that's exactly what happened. So we could leave our differences aside and we de determined that the way forward was going to be different and bad things weren't going to happen. Yep. Um, and that was quite a defining moment for me. And it kind of sets us up for where we are now because we made change. We put in a new coach who was also coaching in Australia at the time. And some of my closest friends said to me, you are insane, Jenny. You can't yep. do that. You know, how are you going to have someone who's in the Australian competition and coaching the Silver Ferns? And I said, well, we're going to give it a go. We're just going to see if it works. Um, and for someone like Knowles, that was absolutely the right thing because we got the best out of her. Yep. So we failed publicly um, and we learned, we grew, we changed, we tried some stuff. We had to innovate. We couldn't look to the past to be our future model. Um, and so if I think back to where do you gain that resilience and coming from the bottom back up, we, we've kind of been there, right? And yeah. we did it, and my leadership team were with me with this. And so we're quite primed for this kind of event that we find ourselves in now. Yep. Um, and I think the rest is history in terms of what the Ferns did. They went into the World Cup last July in uh, Liverpool, and they brought it home. So I think it shows us that, you know, we're a pretty resilient bunch. The community as a whole align behind you. They have a lot to say when you're not winning, yeah. um, but that's okay too, right? Um, it means they're passionate and they care. If they were quiet, you, we would be far more you'd worried. Be really, yeah, you'd be really worried if no one really wor uh, cared of what you yeah. were doing at that yeah. top level. Yeah. I mean, and like any CEO, you know, I got lots of really lovely letters cut out of magazine headings and they said some really um, unkind things. Um, but that's the kind of thing of, you've got to bounce back. You've got to be a little bit like Teflon, yep. um, but you've got to back your decisions. You've got to own it and it has to be authentic. Um, so so yeah. while you're going through that process, it's, 
it's it's good looking back and saying here's who we got. There must have been a lot of friction to move away from that old way and to and to pull people into that into that new way. How, how was some of those, like you said, people saying that you're insane? How, how did you do some of that convincing to say, well, we have to, you know, we've got permission to try something new, you know, make this leap with me. How how did you sort of get that across with you, your leadership team, and then have that flow down netball? Well, I think what um, one of the biggest things in leadership is you've got to make people feel safe. And we were at the bottom. There was nowhere else for us to go. So we were either choosing to be in this together or not. And I think when you make people feel safe, you admit your errors so you're vulnerable. Um, I stood up and I said, we didn't get it right. The players didn't get it right. There was no one person at fault here but it was accumulation of errors and there were things that didn't even stem from this very moment in time. There were um, 10 years in the making. So we can choose to be part of the solution. Um, And I think when you're vulnerable yourself as a leader, that opens up other people's ability to see their own part that they've played and where you've got to. And high performance sport is inherently unsafe. Um, people had dropped it that, you know, uh, their yep. careers are on a knife edge. So um, it was a real art of saying, we listen to you. We got a review in place um, with a whole bunch of people and we listened. We made sure we listened to the athletes. We listened to the coaches. We listened to some of our um, amazing matriarchs in our game who add value. We listened to the people we um, hadn't spoken to. So we were really, we did a thorough review we had to make people feel safe in it, though. So that sort of set the, uh, I guess, the planks for your future strategy going forward to say we've we've come out of this. Um, we know where we're going. We've, you, you've got everyone moving in the same direction. Um, so you've, you you launched the future strategy for the sport, uh, Poi Poya, if I'm saying it correctly. Um, the goal of connecting, inspiring communities around Nepal. How much was that? Uh, I guess, an extension of that work that you did in the review of the Com Games and said, this is where we want to go forward. Because this only came out in January this year. Yeah, yeah? that's right. And so the Com Games set a platform. Our, um, our Silver Ferns performances set a platform. But what was really important is our community still felt connected to all parts of our system. And what I'd felt for a number of years is there had been a growing disconnection between what was happening at uh, the community level and the national body. And for me, the connectedness needed to be resurrected. They had placed a lot of trust and faith in us as we went through our review, and we needed to turn back to them and say, actually, you guys know the sport best. What is going to work in your local area that is going to make that lifelong engagement in the sport continue? Because Netball in New Zealand has been around for 100 years. We want another hundred, but it won't be me sitting at a head office telling our people how to run the game because they know it best. And I think the whole intention behind Papoya is to say, how do you harness the strength of that mass? You know, the people that have been driving this game from their kitchen tables for so many years, actually don't dumb them down. They have the best ideas on what is going to engage their local communities and give them the license to do it. And that's exactly what we launched in January is, you know your people, you know your environment best. Whilst we can give sort of guiding frameworks, we're not going to tell you how to do it. You be innovative. You be relevant. You make sure that our game remains safe and accessible for everyone to enjoy. And I think this was about giving the, the mantle back to our grassroots to say, We are all in this together. We want to hear your voices when we decide what our strategy looks like and we're going to be here with you when we do it. Um, And as you sort of alluded to, it's quite timely because for grassroots to stand up again, they're going to need to be creative and have that sort of mandate to go out and do what they believe is the right thing for communities. Completely. Um, So reading... Part of it, and and again, it reads like it was written last week, not in not in January. But one of the quotes that I love was, "The world around us is changing. Sports, recreation, and players changing. Our players, fans, partners, communities are changing, and we are changing too. Mo- moving boldly forward, like I said, that 
that should have been that could have been written in last week in this current in uh, current environment. So so kudos on that because the conversation has been, and I you know chatted with Shane Harmon who's on your who's on your board. How sports was changing and things were ex- were were. Um, we're accelerating and, and sports have been trying to figure out what the funding model is. How do we better connect with grassroots? Um, that's something that, yeah, you have been tackling and, and sort of talking with your partners to say, you know, here's where our strength is with it, with our grassroots. We need to, yes, connect you with the silver ferns, but we need to keep you with the thousands and thousands of, of girls and boys playing, playing netball as well. Is that, has that been an ongoing conversation with your partners? Oh, absolutely. And I guess the world has shifted on its axis since we wrote that. But you're right, it holds true. And it's about just reimagining it with a new frame now. And so I guess where I get quite a lot of energy and excitement from is we've got the mandate. We've, you know, our, our members have looked at that plan and said, we love it. We want to be part of this. And I think that's, you know, it's so timely because we, we're going to need that going forward. But how we do it now will be different to what potentially we could have envisaged under that plan. Yeah. But the whole purpose behind a plan, I am, I am not a fan of big documents that lay out five, 10 years in a really prescriptive way because it is not true. It will not move quickly enough. It will not allow you scope to experiment and transform. So the intention of this is to hold it lightly. And what I mean by that is take the principles, but apply it to exactly what you see in front of you. Um, and so particularly in our environment, we're going to have to have a massive rethink about what does the future hold for sport and how do we keep delivering to our communities because it won't be the same as what we envisaged it six months ago. Yeah, right. definitely. And, and like at the moment, uh, you know, New Zealand coming, starting to ease out and, and doing a really good job in in flattening the curve. What does... Um, you're obviously having meetings around what does return to sport look like? How do you get how do you get people back on courts? Where are you right now in that process? Yeah, so we are obviously taking our guidance from government, um, but we would like to see professional sport get out there. Uh, we think it's aspirational, and there's yep. um, you know a lot of a, a great argument for that in our communities. I think what we are starting to shape up is how do we still deliver and it might not deliver netball in the same way as you always saw it so I think digital is going to come in in a massive way and I think our communities are more ready for it we've given them sort of six eight weeks of practice um, and here we are how we interact with people is going to shift there will be you know there will be an adjustment we will come back to some of our old norms but what we've embraced during this time will remain so how do we ensure that we are relevant in that new scenario? Because we were shifting there anyway. I think it's just accelerated. Um, I think the forms of game that we can deliver, I think we launched, we stood up NetFit in partnership with an Australian um, organisation and we stood that up in New Zealand really quickly because yep. that was a way of ensuring we were still able to create a presence, um, deliver netball. But it didn't. It's not netball as in play with your mates but it's still a form of the game interacting with our amazing netballers um, and embracing those people to make sure that when the time is right they can come back to the game because it's super important you don't want to have this you know lockdown period and lose and you don't want to lose players to the game because they find something else or they don't come back and so so drawing them in you know things like net fit and and but just the connectivity, like I said before, of being at your club and the camaraderie right. and learning teamwork, it's so important to the fabric of you know New Zealand and definitely the same here in Australia. Yeah, look, absolutely. And I think we all are facing that real tidal wave of people moving away from sport full stop. Um, yep. it's a, we've got to create a reason to engage. And that connectivity is only something that I believe, te- you know, it's a unique selling opportunity for team sport. Um, but our youth, you know, we, if young people are not going back to sport, no matter what the sport is, each of our countries will be in, you know, there'll be a long tail on this in terms of mental yep. health, social impact. So we all have an obligation. This is not a, is this, you know, something I want to do. It's actually an obligation. If you sit in at a national sporting organisation, your obligation is to ensure that people have those participation opportunities going forward 
and they're, they're fit for purpose for how people want to participate. Um, and that's how we will use sport as a vaccine to this COVID-19 situation. Yeah, definitely. And I think part of it is also, I mean, a lot of the stories at the minute is how do we get top flight, the top level sport up and running again? And because that's the big headline to, to, to see netball and rugby and Aussie rules and that playing again. So we've got content and it you know, inspires, but, but that secondary piece of how do we get some form of sport training uh, engagement in groups happening is is just as important for, for all those points of you know mental health and and uh, you know just physical health of of the country overall yeah i couldn't agree more it's a it's a dual pronged approach right our community is where the heart of our game is if you don't have that sort of community connection and that lively vibrant community in time there won't be an elite game so let's ensure that we stoke the fire under both but acknowledge, you know, the community effort that's going to be required at that grassroots is going to be immense. It's going to come at a time where everyone has had to suck their belts in. Um, employment will be at, at higher levels than before, yep. discretionary income, all of that. That landscape has changed. But we've got to ensure that we, you know, particularly in netball, um, we're the number one sport for for Maori and Pacifica um, and European girls and third for Asian. So we play a role in so many different communities that we've got an obligation to get out there and make it affordable in the new landscape. You know, we can't, um, this can't be a a pay, a user pays model. That's not the future model, but it won't be the model we previously had either. Yeah. So, so do you think that, I mean, uh, one of the articles that sort of triggered me reaching out to you is netball offering to help other other sports and other codes and sort of this being a time where the yeah, sport is a competitive business. We all, we all are sort of trying to get the same person, but is it a time where we've all got to work together to, to, to get sport up and running again? Yeah. And I think we have to be brave together and say, you know, how do we retain that competitiveness on the court or yep. wherever, but the back office could look completely different or how we deliver, we, we must reimagine because if we're going to stay in our own lane and think that's how we're going to get to the finish line, I think we'll, we're, our mates are going to drop off on the side. Yeah. Um, and if you think about young people, I don't care if my daughter or son plays netball, rugby, soccer, I just want them to be a good person and yep. have choice. Yep. Um, and ultimately, they will land on the thing they most enjoy, and so be it. And and if that happens to be AFL, um, well, good luck to them. You know, uh, I'm not growing a future All Black or a Silver Fern in this household. I'd love yep. to think I was, yeah. But I just want them to be good people um, and enjoy the opportunities that I had when I was growing up. But I think there is a lot to learn um, from netball. In again, back to that, the modelling and the funding of of that as a sport, because a lot of sports have had this top down approach. The big media money comes into the top, and then some of it trickles down. Not all of it, but some of it trickles down. But a lot of sports are now faced with, hang on, that number is not the same. How does it look going forward? And I think that's where there's lessons, you know, from what you're doing in netball and different sports need to look at. What are the new models going forward? That's right. You've got to cut your cloth. And that that rule hasn't changed. It should have always been the rule. Um, That media landscape, as you talked about, there is going to be a shake-up of epic proportions where you can see the commentary about it offshore. Let's not think it's not coming to our shores or our, you know, this area of the world. Um, And where we've been really fortunate is we are quite prudent in what we do. We live within our means. Um, We're reliant on a multitude of different revenue. Our mix is quite different. And I think we have exposure in that, but we have less exposure than some. Um, And so we're really, you know, this is about ensuring sport can rise up again, full stop. If we've got lessons that we can um, help other people with, guide them through or learn together, this is about a growth mindset. If you're going to be stuck in your old ways, it ain't happening. So... Um, yeah, we're really happy to share our learnings. Um, well, that, uh, that's terrific. I really appreciate uh, sparing the time. Um, and I wanted to finish things up with the Sports Geek Closing Five. Do you remember the first sports event you ever attended? Yeah, I um, I went along to the, I think it was 1989 New Zealand v Australia um, Tri-Series uh, okay. held here in New Zealand. Um, went along with my mum, my auntie, 
And uh, I remember looking at those women out there and just thought I wanted to be just like them. So um, that would well, that would have been back in like Anne Sargent would have been playing for yeah, for Australia that sort yeah. of era. And Sergeant, I think it was Waitamanu, um, all of those kind of, you know, they're the, these women are still around. Yeah. That's the amazing thing in longevity. You know, these yeah. are the matriarchs. Um, they're, they're the people that young women like me looked up to, wanted to be like them. I didn't want to be a big CEO of a fancy corporate. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're still, I mean, we're still in the hero building business and that's, you know, that's part of why we've got to get sport back on, uh, back on track. Yeah. Um, do you, you have been to a lot of sports events and a lot of netball events. Is there a favorite food memory or a go-to food when you're going to a sports event? Oh, um, you know, when you're there as a CE, you kind of have to behave yourself and you don't, yeah. you don't want to be, um, you know, just gorging on the, on the, <laughs> on the, <laughs> snacks but I do I'm quite partial to a little wine when I sit yeah. and watch sport I quite yeah. enjoy that yeah well, that's right I mean I think we're all looking forward to be able to do that <laughs> whether we're sitting in our lounge room and watching something on tv I think that would be good what's the uh, what's the first app you open in the morning well I for me it's really important to do some exercise in the morning so yeah. I um I get my Fitbit out and I get out and we I you know go for a run or do some sort of um workout or something like that. Um, yep. It's been great to be able to do that over lockdown. There's yep. no excuses really. No, so. exactly. Yeah, Everyone's now ISO fit and ISO shredded <laughs> and uh, that kind of thing. I'm well, hopefully you're sharing your, you know, all of your uh, routines on social media like everyone else because if you're not sharing it on social media, are you really working out? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. No, it's been good. Um, is there someone uh, that you suggest the uh, the podcast listeners uh, should follow and, and why, whether it might be a colleague, someone you've worked with, or maybe an author or someone you follow? Well, I think one of the things that I'm really impressed about is homegrown talent. Um, yep. And there's a journalist in New Zealand called Suzanne McFadden that okay. has started Locker Room. And yep. it is um, it is a, a media um, agency that is all about promoting female sportswomen in New Zealand. Okay. And what I love about it is the way that they wrap around those stories are really interesting. It's not just about stats and scores. Yep. It's about the asp- inspiration behind it. Um, yes, yeah, some real quality work coming out of locker, locker room. Terrific. I will link to it in the show, in the show notes. Uh, lastly, uh, what social media platform is uh, your MVP? What's your go-to? Well, at the moment, I have to say WhatsApp. This is how okay. I actually connect with my family at the yep. minute, family and friends. Um, unfortunately, my dad passed away during um, this lockdown. So oh, my condolences. Yeah, oh, thank you. And it's made it incredibly challenging, but that's how it's been nice to be able to connect with his family and share some memories and photos. So, um, you know, pretty low key, but it's around that connectivity with, uh, you know, loved ones. Uh, definitely. I mean, it is a time when people are trying to reach out and connect, whether it be WhatsApp, Facebook, uh, house party, all the different things. Yeah. I think we've, I've, for some period, you know, sort of feel more connected with a lot of people you don't normally t- sport, speak to at this time. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, Jenny, if people wanted to reach out and connect with you and, and thank you for the podcast and find out more about what you're doing in Nepal, what's the best way for people to reach out and connect with you? Oh, probably through LinkedIn. Through and LinkedIn? Prob- yep, that's right. Def- definitely. I will uh, send you, I will put your links in there. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, really do appreciate it. All the best uh, coming out of lockdown. All the best for uh, New Zealand. I hope to be uh, back over there. I've got a standing invitation from Shane Harmon to come back over. And uh, as soon as they unlock the borders and things become safe, I look forward to travel again and maybe take in an netball game or two. Yeah, totally. Let's go Trans-Tasman. Definitely. We love your support on our Patreon campaign. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash Patreon. Thanks again to Jenny Wiley, uh, CEO of Nepal New Zealand. Um, I really do. I'll put a link in the show notes uh, to their strategy. Like I said, very prophetic um, in putting it together early this year um, and really spoke a lot to what they what they plan to do, but also it really does fit for the current environment uh, we are in. Uh, if you want to connect with Jenny, please reach out to her and connect with her uh, on LinkedIn, that's where I saw a lot of the articles that she was sharing and that's how I sort of got connected via Shane. So thank you very much, Jenny, and all the best. Uh, look forward to seeing Netball back on our screens and uh, and Netball is back on court. My daughter played a lot of Netball going through school. So 
And like, much like yourself, my mum was my first coach and my mum was a mad netballer. Uh, mad in as she loved it and uh, played played netball for many, many, many years. Um, what I get into, the next segment, the next segment is one slide, two minutes. Um, and this one, this slide comes from a former podcast guest, Simon Kemp. Uh, I spoke to him last year, uh, I believe, around uh, his digital snapshots. And he's done one just recently, Digital 2020 April Global Stat Shot. Um, and this one in particular was all about the types of content that people want during COVID-19. Um, so I thought it was, you know, well worth checking out the whole report. Um, but I really thought, you know, it has been a conversation piece around the sports biz Zoom conversations and the conversations I'm having with digital folk is what types of content do people want? And so it went through to standard content, like people want more films and movies, but they want to be entertained. They want funny videos and memes. Uh, they do want some how-to tutorial videos, which again, similar to what we discussed uh, with Jenny around net, net fit and and. Uh, tutorials and helping people with their skills via how-to videos. I think there's a spot there for sports. Um, and a few others also talk about uh, repeats of classic sports matches and events and that kind of thing. So um, as well as live streaming of esports and those kind of things. So the things that people are hitting on at the minute, um, there's always much, much more in the reports that Simon um, and his team put out. So well worth the read. Um, I'm always looking and diving in those uh, reports and and using them uh, with permission um, in presentations. So, uh, yeah, check that out. It's definitely a slide uh, worth checking out. Um, and my last one, new, you know, it's no longer a new segment. It's got a new segment on my notes, but I've done it now three or four times. Um, it's a do this today. Um, so it's one tactic that can you can implement today that will improve uh, your life. I've gone big on it. You can improve your life. And it's one that I've actually been implementing on the Sportsbiz Zoom calls quite selfishly. Um, it is ask someone what they're reading uh, because everyone is currently in this ISO reading phase and, and filling their days and a little bit of you know self-improvement and those kind of things uh, and getting to that book that they haven't uh, got to in a while. Um, and so it has been a way that we've been closing the Sportsbiz Zoom calls, um, ask, asking people uh, what they have been reading um, because you one, you get a lot of insight into uh, the books, the person, and what they're learning, um, and what they think of the book. But then also, uh, you're getting it from a from another source. Um, uh, it's a great way to you know to uh, to curate what you're reading. This might be so. I've got a couple that have been added to my list: uh, Legacy uh, by James Kerr, which looks at the All Blacks and the New Zealand All Blacks culture. Um, which is, you know, one that I've heard of a lot, but it has been recommended a couple of times on the calls. And another one that I heard uh, today uh, from Juanita was, um, or last night, uh, Culture Code uh, by Daniel Coyle that was actually recommended uh, by Chris Fagan, the Brisbane Lions coach. So they're just, a, they're, they're just a couple, but I do think it's, you know, if you're talking to someone and catching up with someone, yeah, ask what they're reading. It doesn't have to be a sports book or a business book or, or those kind of things. It could just be... Um, yeah, something for for pleasure, fiction, and and the like. Um, that's it uh, for from me. Um, as always, um, if there is a way that I can help you, um, especially trying to get out of this uh, current crisis um, while we're going through this DC period during COVID period, um, is there a way that I can help? Um, uh, please let me know. Um, happy to work with. Uh, podcast listeners and as a matter of fact I, I prefer it um, so please please let me know um, if you're a sports technology business type company and want to reach the Sports Geek audience I really do want to talk to you about the Sports Geek Amplify series a podcast series we're developing uh, to showcase really great tech and, and innovation in the space that uh, I think sports will need uh, going forward so if you want to be part of that series please reach out um, and if you have been um, either displaced, stood down, um, and uh, looking for a, for a gig, uh, we have got a sports business rock stars register. Um, if you you might be looking for something right now, or you might just be willing to put your hand up and help um, the industry while you're on a break and while you stood down, uh, please register there. Connect with everybody on that list. Um, and you know, for mine, it's a it's a really great way to stay stay connected. And then the other way is uh, with the sports business Zoom calls. Um, I'm really enjoying doing them twice a week. Um, they're a lot of fun. Uh, the the fact that we are that I'm getting the benefit of uh, of knowledge, the way people are adapting 
um, their their strategies and techniques and, and what they're doing in the space, uh, but then also the benefit of finding out some cool cool books to read, uh, documentaries to tackle, and those kind of things. You can sign up every single week. Uh, sportsgeekhq.com slash Zoom calls. I'd love to see you there. Um, until next episode, uh, my name is Sean Callanan, and you've been listening to Sports Geek. Join Sports Geek Nation access to exclusive Slack and Facebook groups with regular Q&A sessions with Sean Callanan. Go to sportsgeeknation.com to join. Got a question for Sean? Send it in for our Sports Geek Q&A series. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash questions. Go to sportsgeekhq.com for more sports digital marketing resources.